was raised by two very strong parents. And when I say the word strong parents, I don't mean that my parents were bodybuilders, although my dad did work out from time to time. I meant that my parents were very strong in the way they raised us and how they handled things that came at them in life and in their many years of ministry. My parents were tough on me. Anybody have any parents that were tough on them? Like they didn't let you get by with nothing. They were tough on me, right? They wanted to raise a strong man. At one point in my life, I was a soccer player, believe it or not. And I was on a traveling soccer team. That pretty much just means that our team would leave the town of Wallkill and we would go play other teams from other cities and other towns. At one of my night games, the lights were on. It was like a night game. We're out in this field. I had a breakaway towards the goal, which was odd for me. It was like my first breakaway ever because I played defense. And as a defensive player, you don't ever really get a chance to score a goal because you're not supposed to pass half field. You're supposed to get the ball and then push it up to somebody up the field. But I had this breakaway. My coach tells me, go for it. So I'm running down the field. I've got this breakaway at the goal. It's just me and the goalie. The crowd is screaming my name. It's my moment of glory. My heart is pounding out of my chest. I was about 12 years old. And out of nowhere, a girl from the other team. It was co-ed soccer. A girl from the other team slide tackled me. If you know what a slide tackle is, is when they, they run and then they jump down, they slide. and They're supposed to kick the ball, but all good soccer players know you kick for the ankle. Right? This girl takes me out. And I hit the ground with a bone-crushing sound in my body. Above the screams, I can hear my mom screaming. And you would think that a loving and caring mother would be screaming, My son, are you okay? Right? My son, I love you. No. My mother was screaming, get up, get the ball, get the ball, score the goal. <laughs> I never did score the goal that day. <laughs> I never scored a goal my entire soccer career. But as I got up from the turf of that field, I knew something was seriously wrong in my body. My shoulder was hanging like this, and I had broken my collarbone. I finished the rest of that game with a broken collarbone. And it was not until late that night when my mom was putting my pajamas on that I could not move my arm that she thought maybe we should go get this checked out. I had, I had broken my left collarbone, right? My mom was tough on me. Today's message is this. Get up. Get up. Get up. I did not get carried off the field that day on a stretcher, although I probably should have been. But there have been other times in my life that I had been carried out of situations on a stretcher. There was a time that I was manning one of the cameras in our old building downtown Middletown, and I lost consciousness. To this day, we don't know what happened, but I passed out while doing a camera. My dad was on stage preaching. He said, my son, I love you. He jumped off the stage, ran down to ensure my health, um, and I woke up a couple minutes, hours later in a hospital. Still don't really know what was going on. So there's been times that I have been on a stretcher. A few months ago, my wife Cynthia collapsed in the bathroom of our home. She was in extreme pain. There was nothing I could do to console her. There was nothing I could do to fix the pain. I had to call 911. The EMS came, they put her on a stretcher, we went to the hospital, she's fine. In Bible times, the word stretcher, and, and again, I'm not trying to preach dark sermons, it's, it's going to get better, okay? The word stretcher was synonymous with the word coffin. A stretcher was a thing 
that carried someone to a burial place. For us today, for this message, I want to talk about a stretcher being the thing that's carrying you away from your goal and towards bad decisions. That we could be involved or because of what's happening in society today, we could be on a stretcher that's leading us to dark places. It could be leading us to dark places emotionally. It could be leading us to dark places behaviorally. There are times that we don't even realize that we're being carried on a stretcher towards darkness. You might even be on one right now. You, you might be highly offended by something that's happening and you're on a stretcher being carried away from where you should be going to some other destination. This stretcher could be a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. Maybe someone's watching online today and you still have that idea that you couldn't actually go to church because God's angry at you. And so you're on this stretcher called misunderstanding of Jesus and you're being carried towards darkness. Maybe you're being carried away by a fence. Someone has offended you. Maybe be, you're being carried away by the divisions in our society. Maybe you're, being, you're on a stretcher of a wound. Somebody wounded you. Somebody hurt you. They did something to you. Someone uh, um, said something or did something and you cannot find the strength to forgive them. And you're being carried away on the stretcher of unforgiveness. Legalism, rage, arrogance, shame, jealousy, disappointment. These are all stretchers that can be carrying us to dark places. What we need to do today is we need to get up. We need to get up. Here's the good news. Ready? Here's the good news. Put it up on the screen. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How's that good news? How's that good news? Because we're all equal. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a level playing field. We've all messed up. We've all done mistakes. We all have a past for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we can't look at somebody else and say, yeah, but look, life's been easier for them. We all have the same starting point, dead in our trespasses and sin. But we got to get up. We've all been on a spiritual stretcher at some part in our lives, at point in our lives. And I believe today, the Holy Spirit, if we would listen for the voice, is not this little tiny still small voice. I think the only reason why the Holy Spirit's voice is still and small is because we're not listening. There's only one verse in the Bible that ever says the Holy Spirit's voice is still and silent or small. And that was to Elijah in a cave. And he didn't have the Holy Spirit within him. He had to hear it from outside of him. I think the Holy Spirit's screaming to us, get up. Get up. I want to share a story with you. I want to tell you that Jesus will stop the stretchers in your, of your life in its tracks. Let's take a look at this. In Luke 7, verse 11. Soon, afternoon, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. I'm going to read the whole passage, then I'll go back and break it down. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of a mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bear. Means he touched the, the stretcher that they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, here's the sermon title, get up. The dead man sat up, began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding cities and the surrounding country. I want to explain some things. The word Nain, the city of Nain, Nain means beautiful. Have you ever heard of the, the paralyzed man who was healed at the gate called beautiful? 
It's the same gate. It's the same place. Okay? And, and this is a paradoxical moment. This is an oxymoron of situations, a contradictory sort of situation. They're in a beautiful city surrounded with death. They're in a beautiful city in a very sad moment. They're in a beautiful city surrounded by grieving. And Jesus steps in. Jesus steps in to this grieving moment. I'm going to ask you, could you let Jesus step into your grieving? Maybe you're grieving the loss of your shopping freedom or your restaurant visiting freedom what, or, or, or your non-mask wearing freedom. Like maybe we're grieving some things today that we feel like we've lost. Could you let Jesus interrupt your complaining about your current situation? So much is happening in this little story. I want to break it down for you, okay? This young man's body is heading out of a beautiful city to be buried. And he's not in a coffin. He's not in a casket. He's on a bier, a bear. He's on a stretcher. Probably because his mom couldn't afford it. She couldn't afford anything else for him. And he would be completely wrapped in cloth head to toe. And the fact that Jesus interrupts this funeral goes against all customs of the times. I'm so glad that Jesus is a rule breaker. I'm so glad Jesus is a rule breaker. The customs of the times were that you were to either join the processional and follow along or move to the other side of the street as to not get in the way. It was a shame to touch the body, and if you did, you would become ceremonially unclean. But Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't care about the rules that man made. He wasn't following the man rules. He was following the kingdom rules. He was following eternal rules. Jesus didn't care about what he was supposed to do. He did what he was called to do. I'm just telling you guys today, in this time that we're in, there's going to be situations that God's going to call us to do things, say things, and go places that are not going to be socially popular. All right. Jesus showed us that. His purpose was to glorify God and to conquer death. And Jesus shows up at just the right moment in the middle of a funeral. In the midst of someone's deepest pain, overwhelming confusion, Jesus is there. I'm, I'm just saying today that, that, that maybe you're in a moment even now that, that you're like, where is God? He's in the middle of your moment. He's in the middle of your moment. He's with you right there. All you got to just kind of like press into him. Jesus is walking alongside you. He's walking into your angry moment. He's walking into your argument at your house. The same argument you've been having for 35 years. He's right there. All funerals are bleak. In fact, I don't, I don't personally enjoy doing them at all. Um, I know my position and why I'm there and what I'm supposed to do, but it's very hard for me. I'm a, I'm a feeler, um, which means I feel people's emotions and, and they're heavy on me, uh, but yet in, in this sort of moment, like people look to their leader for strength. It's hard to be that. But this one right here, this one that we're talking about, is especially heartbreaking. Because the scripture says that this young man was this only son of the widow. Which means she has already lost her husband, and now she's lost her only son. If you were a widow in these days, you were pretty much destined to live a marginalized life. You were basically broke. 
you were not allowed legally to own property, nor could you own a business. You were dependent on your relatives, normally your oldest son. Your oldest son would take you in and take care of you. If you didn't have a son or he passed on, you were going to live impoverished. Poverty for sure, most likely begging on the streets for money just to eat. That's the fate of the mother in this story. But then Jesus steps in. Say this with me. Just say, Jesus steps in. We got to understand this. But then Jesus steps in. In that moment where she's already reconciled in herself, this is my fate. This is what my future is going to be. This is when it's, it's like at the breaking point, the bottom of the barrel, Jesus steps in. In moments like this funeral, it was customary to walk up to the grieving mother and say a line like this. Are you ready for this garbage? This is, this is what was customary. You'd walk up and you'd say, don't cry, for it doesn't do any good. Man. Come say something like that to a New Yorker. You're going to get an earful back on that. Don't cry. It doesn't do any good. But when Jesus sees her, he walks up and he begins the customary saying. Don't cry. Don't cry. He doesn't finish the customary saying by telling her it doesn't do any good. He's saying don't cry because he knows what he's about to do. He's trying to tell her don't cry so that he's trying to give her hope. He's trying to say, honey, just hang on. Just a few more seconds. Just, just hang on, honey. Honey, right now, if you knew what I knew about your current situation, you wouldn't be crying. If you knew what a month from now was going to look like, you wouldn't be crying. If you knew what next year was going to look like, you wouldn't be crying. He knew that he was about to do something to remove the cause of her pain and to remove the cause of her sadness. So he walks up. And he grabs a hold of the stretcher. Now, th dude, like, everything stops because everyone's like, what did you just do? You can't do this. Everybody freezes. Everybody stops. And... And I love that it says that he grabbed a hold of the stretcher. And it stops. And I think it stops for one of two reasons. The first one, they're just shocked. No one's ever done this. No one's ever done this. You can't do this. So they just, they stop. Secondly, I think he grabbed it with authority. Mm. I think he grabbed that thing, uh, stopped everybody right in their tracks. Listen to me today. Listen to me today. If you've ever been told, if you've ever been told that when you mess up, God turns his back on you and God can't hear you, the only prayer that he can hear is you asking for forgiveness, then God can turn. I'm telling you right now, Jesus walks in and he grabbed a hold of the thing, taking this boy to the grave. He grabbed a hold of the sin. He grabbed a hold of the destruction. He grabbed a hold of the bad behavior. He grabbed a hold of it, and he says, it stops here. It stops now. <laughs> Could you let him walk into the thing that, mm, mm. Maybe, maybe someone in here, you've seen the same generational behavior passed down from generation to generation to generation. An alcoholic raising another alcoholic, raising another alcoholic. Well, an abuser raising another abuser, raising another abuser. Let Jesus grab a hold of that thing. It stops now. It stops here. It's not getting passed on to another generation of angry people. Anger stops now in our family. Yelling at our kids stops now in our family. Let him walk in and grab a hold of that thing. Jesus holds on to the thing that was leading this boy to the grave. 
and he's holding on. He didn't just grab it and let go. He's holding on. He's holding on to you. He's holding on to you in these moments. He's holding on to you in a moment of loss. He's holding on to you in a moment of heartbreak. He's holding on. And then Jesus speaks. Young man, I say to you, get up. And, and in your Bible, did they put up? Yeah. I love the fact that it has an exclamation mark. In my Bible, it has an exclamation mark. I love that. It means that he spoke with authority. He didn't speak with, could, could you get up, please? It's like when we're trying to wake our kids up in the morning. Come on, Johnny, get up. It's time to get up out of bed. Make your breakfast. I'll make your pancakes. I wasn't raised that way. My mom walked into my room and literally ripped the sheets off me. That's how she woke me up in the morning. Or she'd, or she'd passive-aggressively wake me up. She, this is, she'd walk in with the vacuum. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. She's vacuuming. Ah, get out, it's a Saturday. <laughs> Jesus spoke with authority. Young man, church, Orange County, get up. Get up. Jesus wasn't hoping for something cool to happen. He was giving the situation an order. Oh my gosh. Somebody needs to grab a hold of their finances and speak at their finances with authority. Tell their finances to get an order. In fact, Jesus was giving death an order. He said, death, let loose of this young man. The situation does not have the power. Jesus has the power. Jesus has the power, not your problem. Your problem doesn't have the power. Jesus does. Well, Pastor Mike, I'm actually in a really good spot right now. I don't even have any issues. Great. Then let's lift up and pray for those who aren't as lucky as you. Because your friend who's struggling right now might be the next miracle. They might need your prayer. Since you're in a good place, since you already have the victory, since you've already come through to the other side, since everything is working out great, then let's lift up those who were around us. Let's, let's remember this. You're in that great place because Jesus brought you out of a bad place. We celebrate those today who got up. And here's what happens when you get up. And I love how the message translation writes this. It'll be up on the screen. Luke 7, 16. They all realized that they were in a place of holy mystery. They stopped it's like, oh my gosh, did that just happen? They realized that God was at work among them. It's funny because they say, well, the prophet is now or back among us. He never left. The prophet never left. They were just unaware of his presence. Jesus is at work among us. Watch, he says this. They were quietly worshipful, which they were just like, oh, Lord. Something just happened. Something just happened in my life. Something just happened before my eyes. And then, noisily grateful. I love how he says that they were quietly worshipful. They were stuck in awe. And then they're like, that was awesome! <laughs> noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. He never left. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. The news of Jesus spread through all the country. And here's my prayer. Here's my prayer. As we transition out of COVID-19 situations and we step out of quarantine kind of quietly and uncertain because we still don't know we're still kind of like, are we still waiting for a second wave? Are we in the clear? 
kind of still in a quietness. I pray that as we come out of that moment, that there would be a shift in the atmosphere, that there would be a shift in the heavenlies, that there would be a shift in us spiritually, that we would come through and shift into noisily grateful. And my prayer is at that time, the church of God, the church universal, the church across America would get up. And that the news of Jesus would spread throughout the country. I think for some of us, we need to get out of the way of the miracle. And I think our opinions get in the way of miracles. Our opinions of other people. You look at somebody else and you could judge them, but yet they might be a, a, a miracle. The person that you're judging might be the miracle that you're supposed to help. But your pride, your socioeconomic status, the color of your skin, may not let you step into that miracle-making moment. And guess what? God will use somebody else. He's not going to stop someone else's miracle from your boneheadedness. Huh? My prayer is that praises would rise from the spirit of all of us believers. That we would put some music on in our cars or in our homes, and we'd let grateful praise rise to Jesus Christ. Jesus, we celebrate you today. Father, we thank you for saving us. Jesus, thank you for calling us off the stretcher and leading us to eternal life through you. We thank you for stepping into our dark moments. Thank you for stepping into our hard moments. Thank you for stepping into the moments that we lack wisdom. And you grab a hold of that situation and you lead us with authority. You lead us with power. Holy Spirit, we thank you that we are in here safe today, that we are protected. I pray that the blood of Jesus Christ runs through our veins, that the power of the living God is within us. I thank you, Lord, that we are protected. Our households are protected. Lord, today, we lift up our tithes and our offerings to you. We pray that you use them for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your honor. We pray, God, that as we sow seed into the kingdom of God, that it is returned to your people. I thank you that you promised us in Malachi 3.10 that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we didn't have room enough to receive. And Jesus, we know there's never another scripture that says you ever close those windows. You open them in the Old Testament and they flow blessings through the entire New Testament. We thank you, Lord, for blessing your people, making provisions for your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.